part two, further analysis, discussion, and the man behind the podcast. So this feels much more safe and at home for me because I'm used to asking the guests about their philosophical positions rather than the history or um, other people's philosophical positions. We wanted to hear a little bit more about the podcast because it, it's an invaluable resource for anyone listening. I've been listening it, to it for about three or four years now. The level of depth and the quality of the episodes, there must be an incredible amount of work that's gone into that. I'm not joking when I say it's unrivaled. It's a project that I guess next to it, um, Bertrand Russell's book sat on the shelf here, History of Western Philosophy. That's very detailed, but you're putting people like Russell to shame with the amount of detail you're going into here. Um, could you expand on, I guess, the story, the adventure you've been on over the last uh, six years, uh, eight, eight years? Over the last eight years, what, what inspired you to do it and what are some of the biggest challenges, I guess, you faced over that period of time? Well, first of all, since listeners can't see me, I should say that I'm blushing. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I say, I had a more narrow conception of it when it started, but because I didn't plan on doing, you know, global philosophy, I planned on doing basically European philosophy plus philosophy in the Islamic world, and I've broadened it since then. Mm -hmm. But even if I hadn't broadened it like that, and actually the broadening it makes it easier to some extent because it means that I've got co-authors helping me, and they write some of the scripts as first drafts, and we kind of go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, but even if even if we had le left that aside, you know, if if uh, someone had come up to me and said, "So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm just going to put out a weekly podcast in which I start at the beginning of the history of philosophy and I cover the entire thing without leaving anything out," I would have just laughed in their face. Right? <laughs> and so, I guess the question is, why didn't I not? Why did I not laugh in my own face when I thought of doing it? Apart from the anatomical impossibility. <laughs> And the answer is really that I was listening to mm. podcasts myself and I noticed that there wasn't anything like this. And I thought, you know, if there was one podcast that I wish existed that I would really love to listen to, it would be that because mm -hmm. I really like history podcasts and I love philosophy, obviously. And I just thought it would be so amazing if someone treated the history of philosophy the way that historians, I think the best historians treat history, which is like a story. You know, it just kind of naturally leads on like this ba This battle was fought. Here's who won and why. And here's the outcome of the battle. And here's how they responded to the outcome of the battle. Yeah. And here's the social context. Da, 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 da. And I really love that kind of uh, history. And I also noticed that it's something that history podcasters can deliver because they're not under any mm. time constraints, right? They just put it out as fast as they want to. So something like, uh, for example, the British History Podcast, which is another one that I listen to, he goes absurdly slow. I mean, he goes even slower than I do. So he's been doing Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Britain for like three years or something. Uh -huh. um, but it's really fascinating. And, you know, every episode is worth listening to. So um, one thing I, I was thinking is that it would free me from a frustration that I face in teaching, which is that, for example, when I teach ancient philosophy, uh, you know, here in Munich, we might have, let's say, a 13-week semester. Mm -hmm. It's one lecture a week. So I've got 13 mm -hmm. sessions to convey what ancient philosophy is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I actually tell the students on the first day, you should bear in mind that I'm not going to be able to come even close to covering what ancient philosophy is. I'm just going to give you this very little sort of small slice. Yeah. And whereas before that was just a frustration to me, now I can say, so go listen to my podcast and you'll hear the whole story. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's really the completeness of it and also the continuity of it mm. that matters to me most. So that that's maybe one thing. And the other thing that I like about it, or that I was at least shooting for, is to present philosophy in that level of detail, but at an introductory level. Mm. So the idea of, let's say, someone like Henry of Ghent, who's a late 13th century scholastic that isn't even taught in undergraduate philosophy almost ever. Mm. Uh, so he's someone sort of around the time of Aquinas, but even a fairly detailed course on medieval philosophy would probably just skip from Aquinas to Scotus. But actually, that's how I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. But I have a whole episode on Henry of Ghent, mm. and it's an episode that I'm I'm writing with like a beginning undergraduate in mind. Okay. So the idea of like combining the level of detail with kind of accessible a pitch to a broad audience, 
that I thought was something that no one's really tried to do before. And so that's what I'm aiming for. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I always manage that, but that's the goal. When you eventually get to the modern day, um, what are you going to do then? On the main feed, are you just going to leave it as you reach like 2018 and you say, oh, there you go, there's the history of philosophy. Or like you said earlier, the history of philosophy is happening now. Are you going to carry on you know, <laughs> doing contemporary philosophers and com yeah, contemporary debates and I've discussions? Had, I have this, uh, I've had this thought <laughs> as kind of a joke where I could start having episodes that begin this week on the history of philosophy, this week in the history of philosophy, <laughs> and just like report on what was published in the last week. You'd be a, you would just be a new show. That would yeah. be fantastic. Uh, but I mean, for, okay, I think the, the first answer to that question is I really don't have to worry about this because at the rate I'm mm -hmm. going, I won't get to now for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. But also- That'll be 30 years in the past. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> um, people can revisit this podcast and say, ah, he wasn't worried about it. He should have been. Um, <laughs> but I mean, the other, the more serious answer would be that uh, in some sense, I, I guess that I do imagine stopping at some point. And I can imagine stopping mm. like maybe in 1900 or the mid 20th century, because at some point you're getting into philosophy that's really kind mm. of now. Like people mm -hmm. are still arguing about it and what it means. And it's not really treated the way that history of philosophy is treated. I even thought at so early on that I might stop at Kant. Um, but then I can't really imagine not doing like Hegel and Nietzsche and Wittgenstein. So it seems like, um, you know, what the audience would want me to do and what I would like to do would be to go up to at least the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like I said, that's so far in the future that promising to do that would be silly. Yeah, it'd be dishonest for me after reading some of your listeners' comments and reviews and stuff that they obviously really want you to to carry on and get there. So it'd be dishonest for me not to encourage you to do so because I think a lot of you fans would really appreciate you going to as far as you can. I guess there's people who are like, oh, I really don't want him to stop. So I thought we'd get into a bit about the man behind the podcast and ask you just some, some classic philosophical fields and, and what your thoughts are. Peter, do you subscribe to any particular ethical theory? Um, and if not, or if you do, uh, why? Well, I really don't like consequentialism. <laughs> so uh, this is actually maybe true of me in general, is that I tend to have a firmer grip on views I don't like than views I do like. Okay. So we can falsify. It's if, fine. If you yeah. were going to ask me to kind of rank the three main ethical theories, I would probably put virtue ethics at the top just because I could explain why it makes sense by just explaining Aristotle. So that's kind of cheating. <laughs> but, you know, Aristotle, I find pretty compelling as an ethical thinker, especially if you take the sexism out. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, Kantianism, I can kind of see that. Mm. That makes a certain amount of sense to me. Although I think Kantianism has the problem that if I say, well, yeah, it might be irrational for me to refuse to obey the categorical imperative, but I find being irrational quite fun. So, what are yeah. you going to do about it? There, yeah. There's not spoil some of the joys of life by living so uh, logically. Yeah, exactly. So, I guess that what I mean by that is that I don't. I think that Kantianism has the problem that it's not intrinsically motivating, right? Whereas Aristotelianism is, because the idea, well, I don't want to be a happy, flourishing human being, mm. seems to me genuinely a ridiculous idea. Okay. What is it about consequentialism? I'm going to push you on this. So what, what I don't like about consequentialism is that I don't actually think that there are commensurable goods. So let me put it this way. I think there are a number of commens of incommensurable goods we might want to maximize, mm. but because they're incommensurable, I don't see how you can consistently try to maximize them all. So to maybe put that in a more concrete way, yeah. there are various things that you might want to maximize in life. So, for example, high culture and physical pleasure. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be kind of intention to some extent, right? Like high culture is very expensive and physical pleasure is cheap to produce, mm -hmm. right? So McDonald's food is cheap, but it tastes good. Um, and I, I Not sponsored, by the way, but can <laughs> yeah, Other fast food chains are available. <laughs> so, it's, by the way, it's also bad for you kids, so steer clear. <laughs> Uh, okay. so you might think, okay, these are both good things mm. to have in our society, but how much of one do we want relative to the other? Like how, what is their relative value? And I think the answer is 
they have no relative value that we can really, as it were, put a number on, right? So it's not like mm-hmm. this much pure culture is worth this much sexual pleasure or something. Mm. And insofar as consequentialists are trying to, you know, force everything into a framework where one thing is maximized, and this is really maybe more true of classical utilitarianism than it is of some modern um, forms of consequentialism, I think it's never going to work. So that's one problem I have with consequentialism. The other problem I have with consequentialism is that I think the most plausible form of consequentialism is what's called rule consequentialism or rule utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. And briefly, the point here is that people said to consequentialists, well, hey, you can never tell what the consequences of your action will be on any given circumstance. So it's pointless thinking about acting in such a way as to maximize whatever it is you're trying to maximize, pleasure, or utility, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so your view is wrong. And one standard answer to that is, sure, I don't know mm-hmm. on like a one-off occasion exactly what will happen from my acting in a certain way, but I have rules that I can follow, which will, taken in the aggregate if everyone followed them, tend to maximize the thing I'm trying to maximize. But then I think, well, hang on a second. This is just Kantianism, right? You just wind up with a bunch of rules, right? So they kind of converge on the rules. And then the question is, am I following these rules because of a sense of moral duty or because I want to maximize this stuff that I can't figure out is commensurable anyway? Okay. And then I think that if, if we're agreeing on the rules, if, if ethics is about following rules, then I'd rather be a Kantian than a consequentialist. But then I'd rather it not be about rules at all. I'd rather be an Aristotelian. Good. Okay, just a couple of points on the on your stuff and consequentialism there. I don't think you're unfair to say that you know it's attributed to the classical utilitarians because uh, we mentioned earlier, right at the start of the interview, Peter Singer being t- turning back to a very Bentham-esque, you know, pushpins as good as poetry. I want to maximize pleasure and reduce pain and suffering. And, and that's what I want to do with my actions. I guess... When we say that we want to have this culture in the city and or I could just take some drugs or have sex, that one is just as good as the other for the utilitarian. And that, you know, Bentham's got that wonderful poem, which I can't remember off the top of my head, um, when he talks about the um, the intensity of the pleasure, the duration of the pleasure, um, how far it goes, how many people are affected by it. So a very basic response from the utilitarian, I guess I have ways of measuring them. You say, how can you measure it? I say, here's my way. Um, Perhaps as you're giving your answer, I might be able to find this poem from Bentham. Well, I mean, you can appeal to subjective sense of what's more valuable, but I just don't think that people will converge on the answers. I mean, they'll converge on some answers, right? Like, so everyone, I hope, will say that uh, having satisfying romantic sex is better than eating one cracker right i mean it would have to be a pretty great cracker (laughs) so it's not like people don't converge on their preferences at all ever but Mm. they but they don't but my point is that they don't converge when it's actually an interesting question so you'll have very different preferences like when mill comes along and says well if you want to know what the best pleasures in life are, ask the cultivated man because he's the one who... Yeah. So in other words, ask me, Mill, mm, yeah. right? <laughs> and he has an argument for why you should ask him and not the peasant washerwoman down the street mm. or the pig. But it's such an obviously self-serving kind yeah. of argument that I'm quite suspicious of that. Of course, you could say the same thing about Aristotle, right? Because Aristotle was mm. saying, let's take the the cultured Athenian gentleman as the ethical norm mm. but i'm not sure that you have to build that into virtue ethics whereas uh it's, it seems to me very difficult to avoid this problem of um, incommensurability and subjectivity in consequentialism unless you just bite the bullet and say yeah. well i'm tr- I'm going to try to maximize something very surprising right so not maybe something that not everyone wants to maximize right but then we're talking about so for example maybe it's just crass physical pleasure and, but then you're starting from a very counterintuitive opening position and i'm not sure i see how the consequentialist is going to get us to buy that have you heard uh, bentham's poem no let's hear it intense long certain speedy fruitful pure such marks in pleasures and pains endure such pleasures seek if private be thy end 
If it be public, wide let them extend. Such pains avoid, whichever be thy view. If pains must come, let them extend to few. So that's kind of Bentham's way of giving us um, all these things you should consider in your head on a calculus in a in a wonderful well, poem. I think his view is more compelling than mine because it rhymes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when we originally did the episode on utilitarianism two years ago, I couldn't hold it together by reading that. I've matured across in the last two years because that I, it blows me away that I think that he included that in his writings. He thought, you know, if I haven't got them yet, maybe if I rhyme the things together. Some doggerel. Then... That will do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... The history of philosophy is riddled with religious themes. Uh, earlier on, you mentioned that you were raised by atheist parents. Do you still consider yourself an atheist? Yes, I do. Have you never been convinced by any of the arguments of the existence of God? I'm not going to give you any to try and convert you like William Lane Craig here, but any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I do have preferences between different arguments for the existence of God, Okay. in part because I think that some arguments for the existence of God raise more interesting philosophical questions than others. Hmm. For example, I'm a big fan of Avicenna's proof for the existence of God, which maybe we don't have time to go through now, but roughly the proof is that if everything were contingent, in other words, if everything were such that it could exist or not, mm. so both are possible, then there would be no explanation for why anything exists at all. Mm -hmm. And so we need a necessary being to kind of kickstart the whole process of existence, of things existing. Mm -hmm. And this necessary being should be identified with God. So I think that's a, a nice uh, proof. For one thing, it raises a lot of interesting philosophical questions, like what is the nature of necessity and contingency? Mm. And actually, the intuitions that lots of philosophers are walking around with now, thinking are just the obvious things to think about necessity and contingency, trace back to Avicenna and don't go back to antiquity. And what, what century is this? Sorry? What, oh, what uh, he died in... 1037. There's lots of philosophers have picked up on this along the years, haven't they? They use similar arguments. Yeah, Scotus uh, and Leibniz especially. Mm. So I mean, most modern day philosophers would say if, if they knew anything about the history of their own ideas, they would probably trace their modal intuitions back to Leibniz. Mm. But Leibniz can be traced back to Scotus and then Avicenna is really the father of this kind of thinking. Uh, and it wasn't devised only for the sake of this proof, but it's involved in the proof. So I think that's a really interesting proof. Although I don't think it works. Similarly, I think Anselm's ontological argument is very interesting. Mm. Uh, that's a great proof because it convinces no one except Bertrand Russell mm. for about 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> and so everyone thinks this is not a good proof, but almost nobody can give yeah. a good reason why. <laughs> <laughs> well, we mentioned um, Eugen Nagasawa convinced by, uh, you could have an Anselm, a, a nice reading of Anselm's ontological, which is modal. Um, and that's converted, uh, the first person I've ever met of um, Eugen Nagasawa, who we interviewed, who was converted by that argument. I think it's Peter Van Inwagen who said, no one's convinced by these arguments. And you hear that a lot. Um, AC Grayling told us that no one's going to be convinced by that. And then we met somebody who was. So I'd like to use him as an example. You find it interesting, the ontological argument, but... You don't, you're not convinced by 10 minutes. You're not going to throw your tobacco up into the air and, and claim it's sound. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I don't smoke. <laughs> and second of all, yeah, I, I don't think that it works, the ontological argument. Uh, so in part because I think Ganilo was right in his response to Anselm that if it did work, we could use it to prove the existence of things that we know not to exist, the perfect island, mm -hmm. right? That's an interesting objection, by the way, because it doesn't actually pinpoint what the mistake is. Right, It just shows that form of argument can't work because you can use exactly the same form of argument to prove something false. So it leaves open the question of what went mm, wrong. The reduction right? outside him. Um, and I think that what goes wrong is roughly in the neighborhood of the following thought. What Anselm shows is that God, by his very nature, if he existed, would have to exist. Mm. But he doesn't show that he does exist. So I think what Anselm's proof shows is actually the same thing as planting his version of the modal argument. Uh, mm -hmm. th so the one that convinced your other guest. Um, mm -hmm. well, I think what Anselm has put his finger on there is that you can't imagine God existing when he might not exist because then he would exist while being less perfect than he could be. Right? right. But he has to be maximally perfect. So I think that's right. But I don't think it's right that from the fact that if he existed, he'd be maximally perfect. You can't infer from that that he does exist. 
all you can infer mm-hmm. from that is that our idea of him is a, is of something that must exist. But the idea of something that must exist is not the same thing as something that must exist. I think that's the mistake. But people have argued about this, and obviously for centuries. So, so on that, we're just going to keep with religion for just a split second. So, obviously, doing the podcast and looking at the whole history of philosophy, obviously, religions had a massive influence on on the history of philosophy. Uh, Peter, do you think that's been an influence for the good or for the bad? Yeah, think? that's a great question. And in fact, you just mentioned A.C. Grayling, who uh, is among the atheist philosophers who go around being not very polite about religion. So he, I once heard an interview with him on the BBC where he said something like, well, believing in God is about as reasonable as believing in fairies at the bottom of your garden, right? Mm. And actually, although I'm an atheist, I find this trend in new atheism to treat religion as something uh, kind of intellectually disreputable or fundamentally irrational. I find that very disappointing <laughs> because I know that pretty much all of the great philosophers in history, men and women, have been theists. Mm. And in fact, I think probably the reason why the new atheists think this way is that they're living in a time where religious belief is is more and more taken refuge in a kind of uh, faith-based epistemology, planting Mm. actually being the ultimate representative of of this, Mm. where the theist says, well, we're just going to start out by believing in God because we think God obviously exists and we won't give you any reasons for believing in God. Uh, I mean, we might, but that's not, these aren't the reasons we believe in God. We just believe in him, mm. right? This is planning as uh, so-called reformed epistemology. Or they might say, like Kierkegaard would say, who I know you've covered, um, they might say, well, I believe by a leap of faith into the absurd, mm. right? And if you are an atheist living in a society where the theists say things like that, then of course it's very tempting to say, well, I don't want to believe in theism. I want science and reason. But if you go back further in the history of philosophy, you see that rationality and religious belief were so closely intertwined that they couldn't really be pulled apart. So uh, in fact, often, if anything, what you'll see is reason being justified on the grounds of religious belief. Mm rather than the other way around. So why should we trust our reason? If you ask a medieval scholastic that question, they'll say, well, because reason is a God-given power of the soul, and that's why it's reliable. But if it weren't given by God, then maybe we shouldn't trust in it. And this is how they would argue against opponents of of Aristotelian rationalism. They would Mm. argue, well, look, if God gave us reason, then we can trust it. It won't lead us astray. Can I push you on on this point? Do you think that uh, yourself... Do you think that holding theism to be true is rational? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure. So so what's the deciding factor? So you think they're rational, but you're also rational to hold your view. So is it this kind of planting as reformed epistemology that that you say, I can see, I go my way, you go your way. We're both rational in holding these views, but I think mine is true. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, um, this is, in a way, I'm also frustrated with planting it, just as I am by the new atheists, Mm. because I'm frustrated with the new atheists for saying that Theism is always irrational, mm. and I'm frustrated with planting a for saying that it is that it is rational by conceding almost all of the philosophical terrain to the atheist. Mm. So, that, because what planting it says is, well, my reasons for religious belief are not reasons I expect you to share. So, just let me be in my corner over here, being rational. But I, being an atheist, never thought that the believers, the religious believers, were being irrational in the first place. Right. I mean, okay. is Aquinas well, being is that? irrational? No. Well, it's because they have arguments for the existence of God, right? And the arguments, I, I mean, I don't think that they work, but this. You can see how someone would think they would absolutely. work. You just disagree on different points to where they go wrong. And it's, it seems like they've got a reasonable argument. You can see why they've got that. You just don't follow them all the way. Did absolutely. You know, that? That's right. And in fact, um, a lot of the time, the reasons I think the arguments for God don't okay. work is because they're being presented in the framework of wider philosophical presuppositions that I and maybe we generally don't share now. So Mm. uh, something like um, it's impossible for motion to begin without a freely acting cause. Mm -hmm. So you might argue for that if you're a medieval or an ancient philosopher, but probably you're going to think that's close to a first principle. 
right? That's just what mm. motion is like. Are you open to changing your mind? You might stumble across something when you get to the 16th century or know. something like this in the podcast. <laughs> yeah, Spinoza. <laughs> oh, nature and God are the same thing. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll realize. Yeah, so, so I mean, I think, and I also think that, I mean, accusing someone of betraying reason is a very grave accusation and insult. Mm. And before I would do that, I mean, it, 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 I, well, let me put it this way. Failing to get everything right is not the same thing as being irrational, right? You might rationally start out from certain presuppositions and work your way through certain arguments where I wouldn't follow every step and I might even not follow the first principles that you adopt, like Neoplatonism, say. But Neoplatonism obviously is deeply theist, but it's not irrational. I mean, it's a philosophical system. So I think that the problem with Plantinga is that he gets rationality on the cheap by saying that the really contentious question, namely the existence of God, is one that we're just going to decide by fiat in advance. And though I agree with him that you can be you can defend the rationality of religious belief by doing that, I think you can also defend the rationality of religious belief by being a kind of standard natural theologian of the kind that he uh, emphatically and explicitly did not want to be, mm. like Aquinas, say, or Avicenna. Well, this has been a very rational conversation so far. Um, Peter, do you hold any quirky philosophical views, anything that our audience might be surprised by or that is a little bit more uncommon? Well, I think my views mm. on the nature of philosophy and the history of philosophy are definitely quirky. Uh, but maybe, maybe I'll mention one other one, which actually goes together with something we've circled around a few times, which, which is the, the extent to which all cultures produce philosophy right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I looked at with Chike Jeffers in our series of Africana philosophy on, Af on Africana philosophy is the question of whether you can somehow locate or identify philosophical ideas even in prehistoric archaeological remains mm. of early humans. Okay. Cool. And something we're going to be looking at coming up on that series in that series over the coming months is the idea of ascribing philosophical views to cultures that are not known to us through any tradition of writing so all we know is oral traditions which were then recorded by anthropologists or live on in the cultural memory of certain groups right mm -hmm. so in both cases what we have is the idea that it might be possible to study philosophy, even as a historian, in the absence of written texts. Mm. And I think that that's a really interesting idea. So the idea that philosophy might be might travel through oral culture rather than written culture mm. is something that I had never really thought about, actually, until we started doing the Africana series. And the idea that you might, say, look at cave paintings or, let's say, a sculpture, like a, a wooden African sculpture from the 18th century, say, mm. or come to that, a painting by Picasso who was influenced by African art. So maybe that's a bad example, but just pick, pick your favorite artwork. You might look at a piece of uh, sculpture or a painting and think, ah, oh, that's a philosophical work in some sense. I think that's a really interesting idea. And although I'm not totally sure, I think this is true. I'm kind of inclined to think it is. So this is something that I'm curious about. And I want to think more about in, as I go on. So uh, something that I've thought about doing in the future in my series sort of inspired by what we've been doing with the Africana series is I, I thought I'm at some point I might do a whole series on indigenous philosophy all around the world, mm -hmm. like native American philosophy, Inuit That'd philosophy. Yeah. And that would be awesome. Yeah. Right. And that would basically be a series about philosophy in cultures that lack written traditions of philosophy. And I think that's a really interesting idea. Some you can go away to these places perhaps as well. Actually, interview some some people from. Yeah, I would um, love to do like, that. I mean, obviously, it would be hard to interview an Aztec, yeah. <laughs> but for Native Americans or Inuits, for yeah, sure. Yeah. I would certainly interview experts on those cultures and also representatives mm. of those cultures. That would be part of why I Wonderful. would do, want to do it. In fact, that sounds like a brilliant project. I encourage you to do so. We've got some listener questions, if that's okay, to to finish up with. Uh, first of all, your first one's from Frank M, who says, please ask Peter how he got to be so brilliant. Also, would he be available to accept a, an award from the Peter Adamson fan club on Peter Adamson Appreciation Day? <laughs> okay, so again, I'm blushing. Uh, thanks very much for the question. I guess the, the first thing we need to do is decide 
what Peter Adamson Appreciation Day is. When when's your birthday, Peter? It's in August. <laughs> okay. It, it, well, it's not today. No, is it? no, no. It happened a couple of month, weeks ago. The um, maybe Peter Adamson Appreciation Day could sort of be like when people say that you know you should have the Christmas spirit all year round. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, another question from Chris. I'd like to know Peter's suggestions for the most ahead of the game philosophers relative to their time. The sort whose full importance and insight often isn't fully understood until after their time, like Spinoza. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in a way, I would almost say that that, that's kind of against the spirit of my series, the question, because my series is supposed to show how philosophers always kind of emerge from their context, right? Mm. So the idea of being like uh, ahead of your time in a way that, you know, you somehow you were born 200 years too early. You know, that's not something I really believe in, in a way. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's, there certainly are thinkers where you read them and you think, wow, how did this person get so far so fast? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plato and Aristotle are obviously examples of that. I think Duns Scotus mm -hmm. is an example um, from the early 14th or late 13th, very early 14th century. He's an example. Um, I was very impressed by a philosopher named Nagarjuna, who's a Buddhist thinker okay. uh, from India. So he seems to get a lot of the moves and counter moves you can make in skepticism. And what century is this? He's, well, it's India, so we don't know. Mm -hmm. I can, uh, if I can repeat my favorite joke from the India Go philosophy on. series that we did. There are more uncertain dates in Indian philosophy than at a high school dance. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's say second century AD, which is interesting if that's true, because he's about he's also mm. a contemporary of Sextus Empiricus, who's the greatest ancient skeptic. Um, but mm. his uh, he's he seems to have kind of thought through all of the possible moves and counter moves you can make in skepticism, mm. and if you compare him to the what we have of the preceding literary tradition in Buddhism, it really seems like he got an awful long way by himself. Mm -hmm. So he might be another example. Your final question comes from Wakwas. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, how to make a correlation between philosophy, science, and theology. I mean, how to make them complementary or supportive to one another, as it seems that all of them are moving towards different directions. Moreover, it resulted in increase of polarization. Any solution? I think that's an interesting question because of the premise. I mean, I agree that theology has moved very far away from philosophy and science mm. for the reasons we were just discussing, right? Sort of the fideistic tendencies of modern day philosophy of religion. Um, but I think it goes back deeper than that. I mean, you have really ever since the Protestant Reformation, you have a suspicion of rationalist and back then Aristotelian ways of thinking. And then theologians started mm. sort of moving away from that. You could argue that the seeds for that were planted already in the 13th century uh, and 14th century with voluntarism, because the voluntarists say that God can do anything that's logically possible. And so in theory, the natural world is which we see around us since it's contingent the study of it can no longer be thought of as an inquiry into necessary truth, the way Aristotle said. And so they kind of demote science from a necessary science to just the study of what God mm. happens to have willed, right? So you start already there having a, ten a tension between science and theology. And then I think that that gap widens through the early modern period, although it takes a long time to get to the big gulf we have now. So I agree uh, with the premise in that sense, mm. but I don't agree that there's a gap between science and philosophy. I mean, it depends what you mean by philosophy and what you mean by science. But uh, it's kind of cliche, but true and worth saying that philosophy for most of the history of philosophy has just included science, right? So people like Newton would have said they were natural philosophers, and so would Aristotle in contemporary philosophy. You see a very close alliance between for example, practicing psychologists, experimental psychologists, and philosophers of mind. They write papers together. Philosophers of mind help design experiments. Uh, there are so-called experimental philosophers who actually do experiments. Um, and that's especially true maybe in philosophy of mind, but it's true in other areas as well. So 
I think that philosophers nowadays are very, very keen to bring what they're doing as close as they can to philosophy and not ever, sorry, to as close as they can to the natural sciences mm. and in a way uh, undo this gap that's opened up in the past few centuries between the natural sciences and philosophy. So I don't think I don't think there is much prospect for a coming together of philosophy and the natural sciences on the one hand and theology on the other. I don't really see that happening in the coming decades, to be honest. But I don't think that there's any gap at the moment between philosophy, the way it's being done, at least in the analytic English speaking world and the natural sciences. Rather, I think that there's a lot of mutual back and forth between those two areas. Right. A round of concluding remarks as we finish up. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you, Peter. As someone who's been following your work, as I say, for the last four or five years, and the history of philosophy without any gaps has not just been a huge asset to my own learning, but any students I've had as well. And I can't genuinely can't recommend it enough. I'm not just trying to make you blush as some kind of game now. I really recommend it to listeners. If you enjoy the Pan Psychast, um, there's some excellent jokes within the history of philosophy without any gaps. And the level of detail is just incredible. Just add it to your podcast feed. Listen along every week. It's returning in September, so there's not a better time to pick up. And you can, Peter, if you were to recommend someone where to start, would you say right from the beginning? Yeah, that would make sense because it's a chronological story, so it refers back. But on the other hand, I think if someone has an interest in a particular topic or figure, I do try to make each episode work as a standalone thing because I also have in mind, for example, students. Maybe they're writing an essay on whatever, Aquinas' proof for the existence of God, whatever it is. And so I try to write the episodes in such a way that people can jump in. So it should work if people have an interest in a just a given thinker or topic. Um, I mean, one episode that I actually like a lot is the one about Avicenna's proof for the existence of God and his views on existence. So that might be a good place to start if you just want to look at something that we've talked about in this discussion. Wonderful. But other than that, yeah, start at the beginning and just go. I'll add that one into the iTunes description as well, so you can jump straight to that on Peter's recommendation if you want to. Um, no, Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you and, and a real honour as well. So thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Yeah, I'm going to echo that too, Peter. Thank you. I think me and Jack have done a really good job of hiding the fact that we're just really, really big fans and that we're really, really <laughs> happy with, with, with your podcast. And I think it's just... It's just really fabulous to see someone, um, I think, and I think this is really important now, you know, looking at, you know, women in philosophy, looking at different regions of the planet. And, you know, as we become more and more connected together, um, I think it's, it's never been a better time to get into philosophy, you know, wherever you are all over the world. And we've got fans all over the world. And I'm sure you do as well. And I really like the idea that, you know, people listen to our podcasts and people have conversations and start whether communities based around what they talk about or talk about it with their family or with their friends and that, you know, we learn a little bit more about the human story through history and hopefully look forward into the future where we can kind of move together. Sounds a bit cheesy, but I, I, I sincerely think it does that. And I'm, and I'm really glad that, you know, you take part in that and we take part in it and lots of other people do too. And I think that's fab. And just thank you for being on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and uh, your insights have been really interesting. Um, and I, I can't wait to listen to more of the podcast, even though it's taken up more and more of my life. <laughs> it's just so much of it, but, yeah, so just thank you very much. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I mean, just re with reference to what you just said, I saw recently that Nigel Warburton, who's the host or one of the two hosts of the Philosophy Bites podcast, mm -hmm. said recently that we're living through a golden age of public engagement philosophy. Mm -hmm. And one reason is that there are all, are all of these philosophy podcasts. So there's yours, there's mine, there's Philosophy Bites. There's one called Philosophy 24 7 mm -hmm. that David Edmonds, one mm -hmm. of the two Philosophy Bites guys, does. There's the partially examined life. Mm -hmm. There's elucidations. It just goes on and on. And a lot of these actually started up since I began. Mm. So Philosophy Bites is older than mine and was actually one of my models that I was following for especially the interview episodes that I do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, this kind of blossoming of philosophy on the internet for free is really amazing. And it certainly didn't exist when I was a student. So I'm hoping that it will broaden the appeal of philosophy around the world and you guys are doing a great job as part of that too yeah, thank you. now you've got us blushing as well thank you um, <laughs> pop, 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 pop 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 philosophy quiz i'll do my best so we're doing pop pop philosophy quiz so we've got peter adamson so we've got peter pan 
obviously the famous uh, character from the Disney films and before. Uh, we've got Douglas Adams, the famous author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and of course Peter Adamson yourself. So can I play this one? You've I've never played a game play before. Jack. I've we'll, always been the host. We'll go. We'll go through it um, together. So just buzz in when you're ready. So first one. Flying is learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. I think that's a trick question because Peter Pan can fly. <laughs> so you would think it's him, but it's actually Douglas Adams. I'm going to follow uh, Peter's answer here. <laughs> yeah, one. Oh, yeah, that is Douglas Adams. Yeah, that, you spotted that one straight out there, Peter. Well done. Uh, next one. Uh, to die would be an awfully big adventure. Uh, Peter Adamson. I think that's Peter Pan. That is Peter Pan. Good. Well done. So it's two one there. Yeah, two one to Peter. You need to catch up, Jack. We should have a wager. The the loser closes their philosophy <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Give some high okay. stakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one. Uh, God didn't create man in his image, rather we created God in our image. That's Peter Adamson. I think that's me describing the views of Xenophanes. That is Peter Adamson. Good absolutely. Well done. Reality is frequently inaccurate. <laughs> that's too clever to be me that, that must be Douglas Adams uh, I'm going to go with Peter Pan <laughs> it's actually Douglas Adams well done Peter we'll do one last one uh, and we'll go with for to have faith is to have wings oh that must be Peter Pan um, Peter Adamson uh, it's Peter Pan there Jack you did oh. terribly well done Peter on you can winning. see why I host these and I don't take one <laughs> <laughs> that's the last time I do that um, thank you for listening to this episode of the Pan Sidecast. Head over to our website, thepansidecast.com, for our whole backlog of episodes. Head over to the History of Philosophy website as well as a link in the iTunes description. You can also follow Peter on Twitter. That's at Hist Philosophy, H-I-S-T Philosophy. Uh, thank you to all of our patrons. And we'll be releasing an after show for this episode. So head over there. It's patreon.com forward slash pansidecast. Thank you to everyone there for your continued support. Don't forget, we've released a 24 chapter audiobook, which has killed us to produce. <laughs> Go over there and listen to it. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. Thank you for listening. Professor Peter Adamson. Thank you for having me. And me, Jack Sipes. Thank you for listening.